the USA Emergency Broadcast Network, your source for reliable disaster preparedness information. The views and opinions expressed on this program are not necessarily the views of this station, its management, sponsors, or other hosts. If you have any comments or suggestions about this program, please contact us at radio at usaebn.org. That's radio at usaebn.org. Welcome to a new Zeta Report here on USA Emergency Broadcasting Network. We are live first Mondays of every month. My name is Andre. I'm with USA EBN. Uh, I want to say that we do this once a month. USA Emergency Broadcasting Network is an NGO, which means we're a non-governmental organization who tries to promote and get information out about preparedness and preparedness topics. And we have been doing the Zeta Report, which is a cooperation or a partnership with uh, Zetatalk.com and USAEBN, which brings me to our next guest, who is Nancy Leader from Zetatalk. Nancy, welcome back to the show. Oh, I'm so thrilled to be here. And we have a really interesting show today because I, I got a very interesting uh, you know, set of, of archives uh, from Japan and China that someone submitted for a question. Uh, and it shows what people go through, what people have gone through very graphically during prior pole shifts, the shock, you know, when you have humongous earthquakes, Richter 9 everywhere, everywhere, and uh, mountain building, and uh, trumpets in the sky, and high winds, and the signs of, you know, what they interpret to be like a dragon in the sky, writhing orange monster, and then it all passes within a few hours, and they're left deafened, you know, and, and in shock. Uh, so uh, before we get into this, and I do encourage everyone to either check the graphics on the USA EBN website accompanying this iPod or to my YouTube vid, which should go up later today because, uh, boy, do they paint the picture. Uh, it was like beyond words. They were bronze masks and pottery, and it really tells the story. Uh, let me read the disclaimer. In partnership with USA EBN, Zeta Talk and the Zeta Report will be discussing the challenges of living on a planet beset with change, rising seas, increasing earthquakes and volcanic activity, weather gone wild, and the worry of what to do in a worst case scenario. We will also inject Zeta Talk prophecy on what is coming next and advice on readiness plans and safe locations. Wherever Zeta Talk is quoted, please remember that prophecy is not fact. It is opinion. It only becomes fact when it happens. The Zetas are remarkably accurate, but have been wrong on occasion. Bear that in mind. For more information on this subject, please visit the Zetatalk.com or Zeta Report on YouTube. Questions from the chat and issues raised in the chat will be addressed toward the end of the hour after the main feature has been presented. The Long Eye Mask. Long puzzle and, and speculated, what does it mean? For those who are not looking at a graphic right now, it is a mask with uh, human ears that are four times larger. And the ears on these and, and other masks that were found at the same time in China uh, have pierced ears. In other words, holes in the ear. What does that mean? I think it means that their eardrums were punctured. But the long eye mask is the one that is most dominant at this museum, and it's huge. It's as big as several people together, uh, and and it has eyeballs, you know, popping out of the skull, boing, and you know, as long tubes, which is why they call it the long eye. Well, what startled this person that that was their reaction? In Sichuan province in China, dated over 3,000 years old, these are bronze masks that show a startled facial appearance. This region of China is just north of where the Himalaya mountains are building, so would have had a lot of jolts during the last pole shift 3,600 years ago. The ears of all these bronze faces are huge, showing they are hearing loud sounds. The eyes on the famous long eye mask are bug-eyed in a startled expression. For the Zetas, they are recording what they experienced and quoting Zeta Talk. 
The population was in a state of shock from the pole shift that had just occurred, but wanted to document what they were experiencing in a medium that time would not erase, and it didn't. Their masks are present today and found. Trumpets. Trumpets are much predicted in the Bible and in the Egyptian Colbrin, and even in Finland mythology. Quoting Wikipedia, According to Revelations 8, chapters 1 to 2, the angel sounds his trumpets after the breaking of the seventh seal. Quoting the Colbrin, The days of stillness were followed by a time when the noise of trumpeting and shrilling was heard in the heavens, and the, pe- the people became as frightened beasts without a headsman. Then a voice like 10,000 trumpets was heard. The sky itself roared like 10,000 lions in agony. Well, certainly, and, and you know, um, the Zetas have said that's upper atmosphere uh, lightning, uh, is, which, which who would think, you know, but there's plenty of that goes on during the passage. In Finland, there is a legend that the Norse god Heimdall would blow the mythical Gallerhorn during a time of very cold winters to warn of the Viking apocalypse. What is causing these trumpeting sounds during the hour of the pole shift? For the Zetas, there's much lightning in the upper atmosphere, the same scenarios that cause thunderclaps in the lower atmosphere. Quoting Zeta Talk, due to the extreme friction caused by the wafting charged tail of Planet X, lightning discharge is humongous, with massive crackling discharge leaving the Earth's upper atmosphere. This creates voids in the upper atmosphere which clap, causing vibration in the lower atmosphere where such vibration is interpreted by mankind as trumpets or horns. So there we have the seventh seal and the seven people trotting out, blowing their horns. Why seven? Because uh, Nibiru has moon swirls or or moons that trail after it. They don't go round and around. They trail after it because it's constantly on the move. It moves into our solar system, turns around, goes back out, and has it has two foci, our sun and another dark binary twin of our sun. Our sun has a binary. So it's always on the move, and it drags these moons, which collect more, debris and smaller moons behind them, etc. And these are often seen as a string of pearls, which is another phenomenon, you know, that people have seen in the sky, recorded, photographed, etc. So I think the seven means that there are seven distinct dominant moons that are strung out next to Nibiru as it during the passage and therefore the seven trumpeters. In Japan, which is a series of islands surrounded on all sides by water, the Pacific Ocean to the east and south and the Sea of Japan to the west and north, the last pole shift was recorded on pottery, the Jamon pottery of the era. This is considered to be some of the oldest pottery on earth, so like the bronze masks of Sichuan on a medium that would stand the test of time. The Juman pots show aggressive wave action on four sides of the pot. Once again, we also see the light spirals that have increasingly shown up in mankind's skies of late, particularly in Norway in 2009, and have been found on caveman walls. These are magnetic swirls caused by the confusion caused by the skies of the magnetized tail of Nibiru, which wafts about the earth. The Jamon pottery clearly shows the relationship between the assault of waves from all sides and these magnetic squirrels in the sky. They are shown together on many pots. What to do about the assault of waves? The Zetas advise to be 100 miles inland and 200 feet above sea level for the hour of the pole shift. Magnetic swirls are not harmful, but a confused compass and electromagnetic chaos will likely scramble electronic communications. Well, it certainly is doing enough of that today. Schumann resonance is just out of sight. Another pole shift shock is likely to be firestorms. This is beyond flash fires due to dry vegetation sparked by lightning. It is a blanket of fire dropping down on those below. 
In the opinion of the Zetas, this is caused by organic compounds in the vast tail of Nibiru. Gathered during the era when Nibiru passed through what is now the asteroid belt and pelted to pieces, many water planets there bore life. Wafting over volcanoes on Earth, these organic particles are combined into petrol and set ablaze. Here again, the Zeta warning to be 100 miles from any volcano likely to erupt is key. All these tales of firestorms during past pole shifts took place in volcanic territory. Quoting the Egyptian Colbrun, A strange flowing fire ran along the ground. Quoting Vilikowski, who narrated uh, mythology from other peoples around the world. Popovul, the sacred book of the Mayans, narrates people were drowned in a sticky substance raining from the sky. A similar account is preserved in the annals of Kachuatan. The age which ended in the reign of fire was called the Sun of Fire Rain. In Siberia, the Vogels carried down through the centuries and millennium this memory. God sent a sea of fire upon the earth. In the East Indies, the aboriginal tribes relate that in the remote past, water on fire rained from the sky. So you say, what's this about petrols? Well, in, in fact, um, the Zetas say that oil that we pump up from Saudi Arabia and elsewhere it didn't get created on earth by rotting dinosaurs. They have never been able to recreate oil from such a thing, pressure and heat, etc. Well, no, it doesn't. In the lab, this cannot be recreated. But what we have from the asteroid belt, clearly something got pelted to pieces up there. And all these uh, long-period comets that come swooping in called, uh, you know, dirty fire, uh, dirty ice balls, dusty, dirty ice balls. Well, where'd the water come from? It's slinging around our sun and back out that. Well, it's because there were water planets in the asteroid belt. And when they got pelted to pieces, the magma inside became the asteroids, because where else did they come from? And and uh, uh, the water, uh, you know, became our dirty snowball comets and uh, and what about petrol well if you had life on these planets which they did they were water planets life bearing then you have organic chemicals that are being carried in the vast tail greasy tail we get greasy halos in the sky quite often because so why does the moon have a halo why does the sun have a halo what's this greasy stuff and and it is from the tail of Nibiru so when it wafts over volcanoes, you know, where you have cracking, where they pump oil up and they crack it to refine it, etc. Well, you can have that type of action going on from the heat of volcanoes, and it creates petrols from all the greasy elements in the tail and rains down on Earth. If the ground is broken up from, uh, you know, the earthquakes, etc., that are ongoing at the time, seeps into the ground. Oh, there's a pool of oil waiting to be discovered by our oil companies. Quoting the data talk on fire tornadoes, petrochemicals are in essence created due to the light, the flashes of lightning and intense heat due to passage over open volcanoes. And these petrocarbons rain down a fire at times, a firestorm killing all beneath it. What to do about these firestorms? For the Zetas, your best location will be laying flat in a shallow trench, not in buildings and not underground in a dungeon. The trench will not fall on you, crushing you, and you will be out of hurricane force winds and whatever these winds are slinging about. Pull a sod-covered board over you or a piece of tin roofing to protect from firestorms. The most recent Homeland Security show that showed uh, myself, my son, and uh, a nice gent up there in Brit British Columbia, clearly a Zeta Talk fan who had dug this two-foot trench and was covering it with a tin, uh, a tin uh, piece of tin. And and a boy, uh, that's what you need to do. And he said, go in there, pull the tin over you, you're fine until after the pole shift is done. So. Uh, Listen, watch American Heroes the next time How the World Ends, Planet X uh, comes back on. 
The ripping and jolting of the earth's plates are certainly written in the earth. Take, for instance, the clear evidence along the San Andreas fault line in California. For the Zetas, the pole shift lasts an hour, and the jolts during earthquakes will be no more than the Richter 9 experienced by man. You in your trench will not be harmed by this. Quoting Zeta Talk, Plants survive as they are rooted and their seeds are everywhere, and animals including man survive because they travel with the moving plates of the earth and experience no more severe a shock when the plates stop moving than they would during a Richter 9 earthquake. Where mountain building occurs when the plates stop moving, the stoppage is not simply a sudden jolt like a car hitting a brick wall. All is in motion, and the stoppage is more like a car hitting a barrier of sand-filled plastic barrels, a series of small jolts occurring in quick succession. End of the Zadok Talk quote. Then there is the shock of climate change after a crustal shift. Evidence of this crustal shift and resulting climate change is found in the ice ages which mysteriously shifted around the globe. Denying that Nibiru exists, mankind struggles to explain why one part of the northern hemisphere is covered with ice, while another on the same latitude is ice-free. Of course, crustal shifts are the answer, as the surface of the globe moves to position that part of the globe to be the North Pole during each passage. Greenland, Greenland was our last pole, and thus is still so laden with ice at present. Mankind is aware that at one point, Wisconsin was the center, at another, Scandinavia, at another, Siberia, etc. For the mammoth, whose bones are found on the Wrangell Island in the Arctic Circle, the climate change must have been a shock. What the hapless humans caught in such a climate shift must have felt is unknown as they left no record other than long eyes and punctured ears. These mammoths were herbivores, elephants, and eat massive amounts of vegetation, tons of it. Are these denying the reality of crustal shifts going to suggest that these mammoths ate snow and ice? Because up there on Wrangell Island, that's all there is these days. In the opinion of the Thetas, the new poles will be the bulge of Brazil and India, both very warm climates at present. A shock awaits. In the opinion of the Zetas, this will be the strongest pole shift the Earth has experienced in the past 50,000 years. Back behind the last the Jewish Exodus pole shift, back behind uh, the flood, which was three back, and back a few more yet. For those who uh, note that the new geo maps does not show the new the Zeta Talk new geo maps does not show the North and South poles tip of Brazil and India on opposite sides of the globe. I hear that a lot. Well, they're not quite apart on, you know, consider that the Atlantic is going to rip open. A scripted drama that has been going on since Pangea was pulled apart and the Pacific compresses, which is going on today. Another shock will be the experience with the appearance of Nibiru. Recorded in legend and mythology around the world is the appearance of Nibiru during a passage. It is Shiva, the god of destruction and renewal in India, but it is described by the Egyptians in the Colbrin in writing, in writing. <clears throat> Quoting the Colbrin, the doom shape, called the destroyer in Egypt, was seen all about the lands. In color, it was bright and fiery, in appearance, changing and unstable. It twisted about itself like a coil. It was not a great comet or a lucent star, being more like a fiery body of flame. Its movements on high were slow. Below it swirled in the manner of smoke, and it remained close to the sun, whose face it hid. End of the quote from the Colbrin. Does Nibiru just show up one day during the hour of the passage? It is seen regularly by the public now and denied by NASA and astronomers who do not wish to be, quote, suicided, end quote. Its many faces started in 2003 when it could be seen in the night sky at the coordinates given by the Zetas. The double helix shoulder pads are still visible today in photo captures. 
although shoulder pads, by the way, are the two dominant wounds on either side, and each with their own entourage of smaller moons, etc., and then they twist around in a helix kind of manner. So, and that's what you see when it comes dead on. <clears throat> when Nibiru began to be seen by the public as a second sun at dawn or dusk, when the angle of sunlight is such that it bounces off the vast dust cloud shrouding Nibiru, people think uh, that's the second sun sighting. People think they see the sun rise or set, and lo, the sun rises or sets again in a slightly different place. This phenomenon was completely ignored by the media and official sky watchers. Who are you going to believe, they ask, our official version or your lying eyes? Another feature occasionally seen naked is this, uh, naked eye is the string of pearls phenomenon. This has been recorded on film since 2004. A recent sighting was dramatically captured last November 2017 by some hunters along the Missouri River. Just a dramatic and absolutely not a fraud. I mean, they submitted their photo for examination. This is not shopped. You know, it, it's, it's the real thing. Um, this, they saw the string of pearls overhead, 12 Count them. Pop, 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 pop. There's more than one string of pearls, but this one had 12. And then the moons parted, or pardon me, the clouds parted, and I know that sounds biblical. It's funny. The clouds parted, and in the crack in the clouds, and, and with a string of pearls up ahead, down came the light through the opening in the clouds onto the Missouri River, and there were 12 spires of light, you can count them, coming down through the opening in the cloud. It was just I, I have to think that was assisted. If only that the clouds parted. That had to be assisted. Because there they were with the camera, and it was just a perfect time and a perfect day. They saw the string of pearls overhead, uh, and each of those 12 moons reflecting sunlight down onto the river, caught on film and examined by experts. No fraud. Even Eric Trump has gotten into the act, repeatedly posting a photo of a golf course near Washington, D.C., which showed the sun with a distinct Q marking at the 4 o'clock position to the sun, where Nibiru is traditionally located in the news from the Northern Hemisphere. Now, it may have been that he was trying to say, I'm a Q fan, but he posted that photo more than once and said, Hey, good morning from Washington, D.C. You know, it's like he was like in your face and in your face and take a look. But the fact, and, and even even Trump himself, there was later uh, someplace where the, you know, the Blue Angels were flying overhead at some ball game, and he pointed up to the sky at the Blue Angels, and the photo caught the sun, and there it was, the crack, you know, at the 4 o'clock position, like the, like the letter Q, but also that's where Nibiru is. Perhaps he was referring to Q. Um, and Q has also hinted at Nibiru from time to time, particularly in a photo titled Just Waiting, which shows Nibiru and its two dominant shoulder pads again at the 4 o'clock position to the sun. When I saw that photo, Just Waiting, I had a hunch about it, and I started you know, enhancing it, increase uh, the saturation, change the hue. All I had to do was increase the saturation a little, and boom, because there was the sun up there, you know, and then at the four o'clock position, there was an orb and two other orbs close by, and they were just as bright as the sun, but everything else was a softer blue. There you go. Another shock well recorded in the Bible and in the Egyptian cauldron is the earth wobble. In the opinion of the Zetas, this wobble is, occurs because the magnetic north pole of Nibiru pushes against the Earth's north pole, thus causing a daily wobble. This is quite palpable, and I, Nancy, measured this with a team of international observers in 2004. If looking down on the north pole of Earth, it makes a figure eight. First, the polar push against the north pole when the sun is over the Pacific. Then a swing to the right, then to the left or swing to the east and to the west, let's put it that way, then a bounce back when the sun is over the Americas and the whole cycle starts again on another day. Quoting the Talmud, seven days before the deluge, the Holy One changed the, pr the primeval order and the sun rose in the west and set in the east. Quoting the Hadiths, the hour will not be established until the sun rises from the west. Quote from the Colbrin, 
The earth turned over as clay spun upon a potter's wheel. Now, what are we talking about here? We are talking about the lean into three days of darkness, which is known in the Bible, uh, etc. And uh, I think the Talmud and lots of other. Uh, three days of darkness. Oh, well, what, what happens if the North Pole leans, moves away and leans away from the big North Pole of Nibiru, which is drawing closer and closer? What if it, I mean, does it stop on a dime or is there a bit of momentum here? There's momentum. And it keeps turning over until it's almost upside down. And then it writes itself over a period of six days. Now, for that time that it turns upside down and writes itself, six days or so, the, the rotation keeps happening. So where is the sun appearing to rise from? In the west, not the east. Just because that's where their people are looking because we're upside down, and then and then it writes itself. So that's what, you know, upside down for three day, six days is all about. Uh, now, we recently had some of that push away, so it was very dramatic into something, not three days of darkness, but atypical indeed. The wobble normally is determined by the sun being out of place too far north or south, or sunrise or sunset being in the wrong place. But lately, as the wobble has gotten more pronounced, on July 24th, it caused three hours of darkness in the Yakutia province of Siberia at high noon. If it wasn't a full three hours, it was at least for some dead dark, pitch dark. And we had that happen in Alberta, Canada, uh, you know, a month later. So at, at Yakutia, this was high noon. And, and their normal noon was uh, well lit. You know, I mean, not bright sunlight overhead because they're pretty far for nor- far north, but plenty of light, not dark at all. Lots of photos. People said, oh, it was from, uh, apparently there was a wildfire somewhere nearby, you know, 100 miles away or several hundred miles, whatever, but it wasn't. That was not smoke darkness. That was pitch dark. Okay. The polar push occurs when the sun is high over the Pacific, just when Yakutia in the far east of Russia gets its noon sun. Pushed too far, Yakutia got no sunlight. And because the earth continued to rotate, um, you know, uh, it affects Europe too at times. Uh, This happened again in August 17th in Alberta, Canada. Here again, when the sun is normally over the Americas, towns in central Alberta registered that in the early afternoon, I mean one, two, three o'clock or so, briefly going pitch dark like night, so they had to use headlights to drive. In the opinion of the Zetas, this was an overcompensation in the wobble. Now, what, what the figure eight I described to you, over the Americas, you have a bounce back. So it comes south, but what if, you know, they said, no, too far south. In other words, the globe, and can it move that fast? You bet it does. People have described the wobble as happening. They've even got it on film. One guy came out in Maine and and was filming the moon, and his camera, you know, showed it moving whoop, whoop, like that, in uh, in within seconds, it, it moved a, w- a ways across the sky. I've had people tell me they laid on their backs watching the moon in the southwest and saw it go whoop across the sky. Another guy said he was standing in the shadow in New York City. It was very hot. He was waiting for a pickup. And he saw the shadow go move, you know, uh, several inches, just like that. It happens rapidly, you know, which is one reason we have all these violent uptick in winds and weird weather and stuff. It's, and it can happen that you have a dither where it goes, woo, woo, darkness in, in Alberta, and wow, back. Not a continuous static three hours, but a dither. Uh, where while we are waiting for the big shocks to start, we could revisit a subject covered last month on the Zeta Report, the scripted drama. We have had a couple incidents this past month that relate. One is the North Slope quake swarms in Alaska that occurred on August 12th. This is considered a quake-free zone, not on a plate border. And the only strong quakes of record was a 5.2 in 1995. This was the strongest quake in the world on the day, that day on August 12th. 
what on earth is going on in the North Slope, the most northern part of Alaska, bordering on the Arctic Ocean? I mean, it's not a plate border. There's no, there's no reason for, there is a mountain there, you know, a mountain range there, but how did that happen? Because, you know, you come up from the Pacific, you got stuff around, you know, near Anchorage and rant, 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 and then finally way up there on the North Slope. But nothing was going on in the lower ranges at all. So, the Thetas point to the fact that the North Slope is on the northernmost mountain range, where in Alaska the Brooks Range and, in fact, the Continental Divide, wending its way up through North America, touches where these quakes occurred. So it is the Continental Divide end point up there. And it's the Brooks Range on the North Slope. Mountain ranges usually grow because of pressure, one plate pushing inland against another. If this were the case, given that the mountain ranges to the south of the Brooks Range would have been crumpled first during pressure from the Pacific, this seemed to be a mystery to all. For the Zetas, it was the bow stress on the North American continent, pulling one rock, rock layer under the North Slope to the east and another rock layer to the west. This tearing apart caused the jolts, and this has happened before to the North American continent, thus the Brooks Range. They are caused by the, the uh, typical and predictable bowing stress on the North American continent, which we have going on, breaking water and gas mains, Big crevasses opening up, the seaway opening up, you know, all kinds of problems. And it's it's the the tension of the bull. And when it and and it will not relax until we have the ripping of the New Madrid, which is in our future. Then there was a massive and deep quake, magnitude 8.2, in Fiji on August 19th. The true magnitude is likely much stronger, but is considered stronger and deeper than any previous quake in Fiji. Since this is located on the lifting edge of the Indo-Australia plate, this is significant. It is also significant that this follows only by a day or so, the wobble turning day into night in Alberta. This wobble, it may happen quickly, but it's hard on the earth plates. They jerk around, and then you have quakes. The next scripted incident was the Genoa Bridge collapse. The Mor Morandi Bridge in Genoa suddenly dropped its midsection on August 14th after being in place for 50 years without incident, where the bridge designers are being excoriated and demonized in the media. For the Zetas, there is... Uh, uh, an obvious reason. Check the plate and fault lines there, which riddle the area. The plate border between the African plate and the Great Eurasian plate is more or less a straight line through the Mediterranean, but at Italy, it pokes up along the east side of Italy to form the Adria microplate. The border of this Adria microplate runs right down the center of Italy and lobs over to be above Genoa. As the Africa plate rolls, Genoa is pulled apart. Quoting Zeta Talk, the Adria microplate to the north of Genoa pulls in one direction while the Eurasia plate to the south of Genoa pulls in another. Mankind smugly builds his infrastructure, assuming that the earth plates and rock strata layers will remain in place, and expresses shock when the history written in the geography of the earth reopens in yet another chapter. More to come as the African plate roll progresses. End of the Zeta quote. They always, they always lecture mankind. Tut, tut, tut. Not a flat earth. No, no. Okay, then on August yeah. 21st, <laughs> then on August 21st, Venezuela was hit with another uh, 7.3, right along the plate border between the South America plate and the Caribbean plate. Nearby is Trinidad, which is being ripped apart by the plate movements, as South America moves west and the Caribbean is pushed down and under the South American plate. Then on August 24th, the South America roll struck again with a 7.1 quake along the Peru-Brazilian border, right where the Andes is building. 
As South America rolls its top part to the west, the entire west coast of South America is pushed over the Pacific and Nazca plates. Thus, the subduction under the Andes occurs. And that's the end of my prepared lecture points. The scripted drama, you know, is uh, the, essentially the seven of ten plate movements that the Zetas predicted, you know, and, and we uh, were pretty well done in Indonesia, pretty well pushed down, and everybody got out of the way, and all the sea seawater incursions, people got relocated or whatever, and they kept saying, it's just rain, it's just rain, which it wasn't, with seawater coming in and well documented. And then we have the South America roll, which is not yet done, but it's, it's uh, they don't, wouldn't even give recent percentages because they said it's going to move so fast. Uh, Nancy wouldn't even be able to get it out in print before it's changing already. Africa roll has a way to go because they predicted the Sinai would move by 125 miles. It would be further uh, wide. You know, the, the, the straits there would um, be, be wider. In Sinai, it's going to be another 50 miles because the Red Sea is pulling open, etc. You know, and so there's a long way to go on African roll because I'm sure we'll hear about that in print. Oh my, the Sinai is where is it? You know, and we haven't heard that yet, so I don't think it's rolled where it's going to go. Now we wrap around to the New Madrid, and that's the biggie, and that's going to be humongous for the U.S. They said. The Zetas, in the opinion of the Zetas, the uh, bridges going across the Mississippi will almost to a one rip, the way the I-35 bridge ripped in Minnesota and dropped, uh, you know, several years ago. Uh, that was in the headwaters of the Mississippi, but all the way down, you know, starting closer to the Gulf and coming up, and the New Madrid goes. It has a sister fault, the East Coast fault that runs up Savannah, Charlotte's, you know, along the East Coast up into rang the bells in Boston, and it also runs up uh, under Chicago and over under the seaway uh, through Ohio, etc. It's going to be very messy. A lot of cities will crumble because they were never built with earthquakes in mind, and that's in our future. And that's it, Andre. You want to chirp in with anything? I'm sure you're dying to say something. Oh. <laughs> not, not dying per se, not today. Yeah. Um, uh, I do want to say that uh, there has been, uh, you know, you talked about trumpets in the in the talk today, and then that sound showing up as a sign of uh, activity in the upper atmosphere. But I also know that the Zetas have stated in the past that some of the that screeching and and trumpet sounds could be coming from the ground as well, and there was some of that being reported in along the New Madrid, just off the New Madrid. Uh, in Alabama recently, did you think that? Made, no, no, uh, I, no, I didn't. Party? Yeah, that that is true, and and booms, I think, uh, have been around yeah, for right. years, and they said that it's um, land heaving and dropping, and when it drops, it creates a void, and anytime you have a void, the air masses come together and clap, and boom, there it's like a thunderclap, you know. So yes, uh, we we get plenty of. Uh, and vibrating, um, it w the trumpets of Kiev, the horns of uh, Belarus, uh, Tampa Bay howl, Saskatchewan screeching, you know, that, that it's a vibrating la water masses, you know, caused by earth under tension and, and literally vibrating. And then once it vibrates the water, well, that's a musical instrument. You know, you have a glass of water filled half and you touch it with with a spoon or something and say boom 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 you know you can play music right. on water glasses so yes uh water uh, bodies can vibrate and in some places it's music in some places it's noise you know so <laughs> there's all those reasons for noises closer to earth yes right um i was going um for our our listeners and viewers out there, we talk about the wobble. A lot of this is actually documented. But there's, I know you have a lot of sources for uh, Zeta Talk as well as the pole shift Ning for uh, uh, wobble documentation as far as azimuth and timing. And I know the recent report for last month just came out, and it, it shows a significant correlation of a daily movement of where the sun should be when sun is rising and setting where it should be on the on the horizon and the yeah, timing of it 
Yeah, Ms. Nakamaki does this monthly from Wisconsin, and she goes out and records the sunrise and sunset as moves altitude and timing, and she shows that they're they're late or early and off by the azimuth, which is 360 around where it should be, you know. Uh, and it can be off as much as 20 degrees and, and you know, 20 minutes late or whatever. And uh, it's a very, I mean, it, you can't deny it. People say, well, why doesn't somebody go out and measure? Well, she does. You know, and, and it's posted uh, every every month in the um Earth Wobble Mechanics, you drop down menu uh, at the pole shifting, you'll find uh, all her months back and her most recent. Uh, yeah, de- definitely. And, and also Alberto's photos, too, I see that that you can usually find Nibiru at the 4 o'clock position. But because of the lean to the east or lean to the west, which is right or left or however you want to describe it, um, you know, it's, there it shows up over there at 7 o'clock, not 4 o'clock. Or whoops, now it's over at the two o'clock. You know that, so um, it, it's because the wobble is that severe. One one day this past month, we and it was so cloudy, and we're having so much rain. But uh, I, ha- I had bright sunlight, and it was like almost noon. It was like two minutes to noon or something. And I'm looking in my cams down my veranda, and there I see the the shadow, exactly 45 degree. In the southeast, you know, so verified. Yep, there it is. Can't you can't deny that? And I went to check sky map, and it was supposed to be almost exactly 180 south. So I was stunned because that's like 45 degrees off, you know, uh, and that's that's a big right. lean, and and it doesn't last long, and then it writes itself. And pe- when people see this, they don't believe their eyes, and they tell a friend, and they say, "Ah, oh, yeah, 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 no, you're not, you know, yeah, 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 you know, just make look at your phone. Another tale. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, that's yeah. also noticeable too. That people are picking up about the moon, the moon face. As you look at the yeah. moon, you know, as it gets fuller, you get a better picture of it. But you can kind of figure yeah. out. Well, only one side of the moon faces us as it flies around or orbits our mass. And right. we don't see the other side. The dark side's technically not dark because, I mean, the, whatever. But it's the side we do not see. So we only see one side of the moon as on uh, a nightly basis. Mm-hmm. Some folks have out there have noticed, and a lot have been documenting this, uh, on 90 degrees, sometimes even larger rotation yes. of the yes. moon face. You know, the yes. particular yes. crater is at the wrong spot, yes. even according to sky map. Because it changes throughout the season as, as our, our normal tilt for our seasonal tilt. Obviously, the moon would, would change a little bit throughout the seasons. But yeah. at this time yeah. of year yeah. and your location, it's happened enough times that, you know, your computer graphics says it's supposed to be look this way. And then you look up at the moon, you're like, oh, but it's 90. You rotate it. It's like almost right. 90 degrees right. on the dot. Right. Right. This was well documented, actually, way back in 2004, 5, 6, et cetera, by a bunch of people. And what it amounts to, and the Zetas wrote a piece about it in 2004, they, the, the moon's orbit is more tilted. It's normally tilted five degrees off of our ecliptic, off of our uh, equator or center, you know, five degrees only, so that you see a slight movement in the face of the moon, you know, during the day or during the 24 hours, but five degrees, right? Well, it's got a more extreme orbit, it, it and it's trying to evade the onslaught of particle flows that come from Nibiru, and it does this. It's not leaving the Earth, and it won't leave the Earth, no matter how traumatic the pole shift or the passage is. What it's doing is creating a more extreme orbit, so way up, way down. At the full and new moon, it is about where it should be, but between those points, it is too far up, too far down, right? And what it what it really is, it's not that it's rotating; it's that your view, your your angle of view has changed, thus that you're right. looking up at it, and so you're seeing a different. Uh, you know, like if, if I'm looking at Andre's face and I fall to the floor and I look at his face, it'll seem that his chin is more pr- prominent and skewed to the left or something like that, you know. So my view is skewed, but the moon is, is really uh, facing us as it always has. So 
uh, it's actually, if you check where the moon is in the sky as to where it should be, you'll get your answer. You'll say, oh, wait, right. it's way too high or it's way too low. Yeah, you know? see, that's the and, thing. And, that's that's yeah. bring on more research where you look, well, it's not even the right spot either. Right, and that's the, the key. Right time. That's the key. Yeah. And, it, and it is, I'm sure, getting more extreme, as extreme as it can uh, all the time, and that's why people are noticing it more. Well, that's good. And the answer has been in Zeta Talk since 2004. <laughs> I, and I do get this on email. I do get this from people. Oh, look. And I, and I say, here's the link. And I do a lot of traffic yeah. management, you know, in my email. I says, here it is. Uh, they could use the search engine. I always um, lecture people. Use the search engine. Say, moon orbit. You probably would have gotten it right away, you know. So I chide people. So be be prepared to be chided. <laughs> Ah, oh, as I say, bitch slapped. You know, but but really, the search engine, as long as we have it, it's just wonderful. It's a dedicated search engine for the Zeta Talk website. 